When I say civil rights movement, what comes to mind? Oftentimes it's Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, the Black Panthers. Sometimes I even hear Daisy Bates and the Little Rock Nine, Brown v. Board of Education, and Medgar Evers. Well, I was asked a very similar question during one of my first classes here at WashU. And once my professor was satisfied with our answers, he shifted the conversation to something that he found very frustrating. He shared with us that oftentimes when he would ask his friends, family, and sometimes even strangers the exact same question, once they gave events and figure names, they would say things like, if I were alive at the time, I would have marched too. If I were able, I would have sat at lunch counters and let people, people beat me with no response for desegregation. And if I were able, I would have picked up a gun and defended the Black Panthers or defended the black community with the Black Panthers. And for my professor, as someone who marched along with the people of Ferguson in 2014, these answers were very frustrating because these type of answers, they create a distance between us and the civil rights movement. And these kind of answers suggest that the civil rights movement lives solely in the past and that there's no way that it could be present today. And so his point was, the civil rights movement is not in the past. The civil rights movement is all around us, and it is now. So what will you do when the civil rights movement comes to you? And that was a question that sat with me for the rest of that class, and a question that has continued to sit with me for my entire college career. When the civil rights movement comes to me, what am I going to do? Am I going to be an actor, an onlooker, a bystander? What am I going to do when it comes to me? And it wouldn't be long before I got the answer to my own question. Coming to WashU, I didn't realize what it meant for me to be in St. Louis. And I didn't realize what it meant for St. Louis to be so close to Ferguson. And oftentimes, I didn't even notice that the people sitting next to me and learning alongside me, they were student activists in Ferguson. And even now, I am honored to still be sitting with and learning alongside people who had to put their educational journeys on hold or were never even able to begin them because everything that they were went into and into sustaining that movement. And I think that having so many activists on campus and that the activist culture of this campus made the events of October and September 2017 even more intense. In September of 2017, Officer Jason Stockley was found not guilty of murder when he shot and killed black man Anthony Lamar Smith. And I think so many of us thought that this would be like a second Ferguson. Because again, we were angry, and we were upset and hurt and asking why does this keep happening and asking why do we have to keep doing this again and again and again and yet here people were ready to march again. In October, there was a protest not too far from campus and many of my friends decided to go. And I felt like I was stuck while the whole world was moving around me. I watched my friends write emergency phone numbers and the phone numbers of lawyers on their arms in permanent ink. I watched them charge their phones and I watched them create emergency plans in case they were separated from the people that they went with. And it was only when I heard, Ruth, are you coming too? that I snapped out of this daze. And instead of answering yes or no, I would ask things like, do you have this phone number written down on your body? Is your phone charged? Do you have an emergency plan in case you are separated from the people that you go with? And if you need me, I will find a way to get to you and do my best to make you safe. At that moment, I'd mostly decided I would not be going to the protest, but was not quite ready to admit to myself why. My friends marched off to the protest, and I walked back to my room, and I overheard two non-black men of color speaking to one another. And he said, I kind of want to go to the protest, because you only say that kind of shit on TV. And in that moment, I was furious. I was angry. I was hurt. But mostly, 
I was ashamed because for these two boys, the novelty of seeing the black community come together in mourning over yet another death, that was enough to make them go. But my community coming together in mourning over yet another death, that was not enough to make me go because I was afraid. And I know that the white person at the protest is safer than I am, but as a black mixed race person, I recognize that my white privilege makes it safer for my darker skinned brothers and sisters and siblings at the protest. But I was still afraid. I think oftentimes when people hear the word protest, they think this. An image from 2014, people walking together in solidarity, signs up, eyes focused on what is ahead of them. Maybe someone is singing a hymn or chanting. But when I heard the word protest, all I could think about was this. What is sitting and waiting for them on the other side of that camera? It is police officers in riot gear and ready with military vehicles. This is not the picture of people who are ready to take in and embrace in community in mourning and in pain. This is a picture of people ready to destroy it. And I've chosen not to show the next image. But when I think protest, all I could see was our water protectors at Standing Rock and the woman who was hit in her arm with a concussion bomb, literally tearing her arm apart with bone exposed to the air. And all I could think about was, what if that hadn't hit her here, but it had hit her here? She would be dead. And all I could think is, what if she were me? And at the protest, I wasn't hit here, but I was hit here. I would not walk away from that protest whole. But what made me ashamed was that despite this, people still went to the protest knowing the risks. And so after a lot of reflection and speaking to a mentor of mine, she said, Ruth, your fear is valid. And maybe right now, in this moment, Physical protest is not for you. Maybe it will be in the future, but we're not gonna worry about that right now. We're not gonna waste our time on that. Instead, you need to get in where you fit in and do good. And I think that I may have finally found where I fit in. How many of you have heard of the Achievement Gap? Okay, so that's quite a few of you. Typically, the Achievement Gap is described as the disparity between in educational outcomes and attainment between black and brown and low income students, and upper class and white students. And right now in the education world, we're doing our best to get away from the word achievement gap and instead use opportunity gap. Because no student is intentionally putting themselves into this gap space. Instead, it is lack of support, lack of resources, and lack of opportunity that is funneling our students into this gap. And Dr. Gloria Latson Billings, she asks us instead to use the word education debt with the word dead, debt asking us to remember the historical educational inequalities between races in this country. With the word debt asking us to remember that some people were literally killed for wanting to learn how to read and write. And the word debt asks us to acknowledge how this history has created and perpetuated the very gap that so many of our students are falling into. And so I find education to be one of the most critical social justice issues of today. And I know that a good education can be an equalizer. Right now, we have data that shows that one of the best ways that we can support black and brown and low-income students is to support them as early as possible, pre-K through elementary school. And one of the last critical places that we can provide support that is impactful is in middle school. And so, Last summer, I decided to become a seventh grade literature teacher. And maybe I'm biased, but I had the goofiest, the silliest, the most phenomenal, creative, and thoughtful students. And the really special thing about this program was that it was not a summer school, which suggests that my students were behind and needed catching up. No, this was an enrichment and college support program that each of my students had to apply to, and so they were excited to come every single day. 
The other special thing about this program is that we had students coming from each and every public school in the district, including a couple KIPP schools, and that created a beautifully diverse environment. Students of all backgrounds, all races, ethnicities, religions, origins, languages, genders, and socioeconomic statuses. Right now we have data that shows that black and brown and low income students thrive in diverse environments because oftentimes this is one of the first places that supports and resources are distributed equally. And I know that each of my students is capable, able and worthy of everything and anything they could ever want to do. But I still had to recognize that not all of my students go to the same school. And so not all of them are gonna receive the support and resources that they deserve. But I can rest easy because I know with my students being in a program like this, where they're receiving support and resources from people that look like them and understand them, my students are more likely to graduate high school and aspire towards college. And I'm sure any teacher knows that not every class goes exactly as you want it. <laughs> my students did not always walk out of the classroom knowing everything I wanted them to, but I think we all always walked away with something. Even if that was the overambitious, overzealous, kind of scary debate about whether waffles or pancakes were better. <laughs> and when I tell you my students were literally jumping over tables to make their point, I'm not lying. <laughs> and so, that became really, really important that each of my students was able to walk away with something. And maybe, maybe I was teaching the next Malcolm X, the next Daisy Bates, the next Black Panther, and maybe I wasn't. And both of those outcomes are equally okay. Maybe some of my students will end up at the forefront of a movement. Maybe others will end up working at or creating socially aware businesses. And for some of my students, I just want them to live as happily as they can because we know that so many people do not get to do that. At the end of the summer, one of my students wrote me a note. And this student was goofy and bright and English was not his first language and he did not speak English at home. And so oftentimes, 10 pages of reading would literally take him hours to finish. But he always came to class the next day saying, Ruth, it took me two and a half hours but I finished. <laughs> and in the note, he told me that reading had always been hard for him because it took so long and he was often discouraged. But for the first time this summer in our classroom, he began and finished his first chapter book. And because he did it once, he knew that he could do it again. Because he did it once, he knew that he could do it again, and that is so important because we know that that statement applies to so much more than just the book. And I think at the end of that summer, I found where I fit, and that is supporting students just like me in any way that I can. There are Fergusons everywhere. It's all a matter of time and circumstance, and that means that the civil rights movement is everywhere. It is all around us. It is now. And so what will you do when the civil rights movement comes to you? When the civil rights movement comes to you and you're trying to decide what to do, do not let this be an I would have, I could have, I should have. Do not let this be a wasted moment. When the civil rights movement comes to you and you're trying to figure out what to say or do, remember that we inherit all of our ancestors' pain and trauma, but that we also inherit their resilience and their joy. And we are all our ancestors' wildest dreams. I am my ancestors' wildest dreams and I will make them proud by doing good as I desire and by doing good joyfully. When the civil rights movement comes to you and you are afraid, know that it is okay to be afraid and that it is valid because so many of us have things to be afraid of. 
when the civil rights movement comes to you and you're trying to figure out what to do and you're afraid, know that the only bad fear is wasted fear. Fear that is not channeled into something positive with, with which we can use it to do good. When the civil rights movement comes to you and you're trying to decide, all I ask is that you get in where you fit in and do good. Thank you for coming to my TED Talk. <laughs> <laughs>